We are two games into the 2022 season. What about the Jets' offseason plan has worked? What has not worked? We'll discuss today on the Locked On Jets podcast. You are Locked On Jets, your daily New York Jets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome. This is the Locked On Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It's Tuesday, September 20th, 2022, and I'm your host, John B. from GangGreenNation.com. Thank you so much for making the show your first listen or your first watch every day. We are free and we're available on all platforms, including YouTube. If you like what you see or hear, hit the subscribe button wherever you're watching or listening. You'll never miss an episode. You'll get notifications as new episodes are posted. If you're watching on YouTube, please give the episode a big thumbs up. It helps the channel out and it helps other Jets fans find the podcast. Today's episode of Locked On Jets is brought, brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. Just pick two to five players, and if they score more or less than their prize picks projection, you can win up to 10 times your money on your entry. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code LOCKED ON. That's prizepicks.com, promo code LOCKED ON. Well, today we are still celebrating a New York Jets victory on Sunday over the Cleveland Browns, an amazing victory. And we are now two games into the season. The NFL season really flies by, and I don't want to sound like Mike Francesa because that's one of his go-to cliches through the course of the NFL season, but it's true. And I'll tell you why it's true. We're now more than 10% of the way through the season. Two weeks ago, we were getting ready for the season to begin. And in that short of a time, we're now more than 10% of the way through. You only get 17 games in the NFL, and the Jets are already through two games. Now, a two-game sample size is admittedly still pretty small. I don't think we can make sweeping conclusions based on what we've seen so far, but we can begin to evaluate what's happened. Last week, I termed overreaction week, and it's always overreaction week. I mean, this time last week, everybody was panicking. I mean, I've heard a few people wonder, are the Jets going to win a game this year? Well, now they're one and one. Now they're back in the mix. Season was not over because they lost their first game, and now the Jets have a chance to go two and one this weekend against the Cincinnati Bengals. I'm not making final judgments about whether moves were successful or not, but we can't, again, we are two games in now. We're more than 10% of the way through the season. We can begin to evaluate what the Jets did over the off season, especially the positions where they really tried to overhaul what they had, where they made big moves. And we can take a look at what's working and what's not. And that's what we're going to do on today's episode. And we will begin on a positive note. We'll talk about the things that are working. And I think, Based on Sunday in particular, you have to like where this wide receiver position is going. I think on the on the offensive side of the ball in general, you've been looking for a go-to guy. And I don't want to go get ahead of myself here based on one game, but they may have found their go-to guy in Garrett Wilson. I thought it was going to be Brees Hall. If it wasn't going to be Brees Hall, I thought it was going to be Elijah Moore. And those two, they still have a lot of potential. They could You could hear from them before the season's out. But... Garrett Wilson, it's not just week two. In more limited action week one, he looked like a player. I mean, you you remember that play he made on the third down where he almost turned what should have been a minimal gain into a play that where he almost picked up a, a first down by making two, three guys miss in open space. I said it yesterday, I'll say it again. Garrett Wilson just looks so effortless when he's running routes. He's a technician as a route runner. And you combine that with Elijah Moore, the speed there. And Corey Davis, you know, Corey Davis is okay. I think the third guy you want to get is is going to be kind of a bigger bigger type receiver, a guy who can win contested balls in the air. Because you've got the technician in Garrett Wilson. you got this the burner in Elijah Moore. And now you need, I think maybe that, that'll be a goal for the offseason. And Corey Davis actually has a decent history in, when we're talking about being a contested catch receiver. But more than anything, you need the guy, the guy you run your passing game through the guy the other team can't stop. And, you know, it's one game. But Garrett Wilson was a top 10 pick for a reason. The Jets were not expecting him to just be, you know, an okay type receiver. Now, sometimes that's what happens when you pick somebody in the top 10. You're not quite as good as their projections. But Garrett Wilson, the reason the Jets drafted him in the top 10 is they thought he was going to be really good. And he looks like a a star in the making. 
and I understand it. I understand you can get ahead of yourself, and I understand sometimes you know these guys don't live up to the live up to the hype. But that was a very exciting performance on Sunday by Garrett Wilson. It's the kind of performance you build on. I, you know, it, just because you post over a hundred yards in your second game, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're on your way to greatness. But I've seen that happen before, where game two, the guy breaks out, and suddenly it's it's the start of something big. And you just look at the way Garrett Wilson's game translated. One of the reasons I love this pick is it just seemed like his game was going to translate really well to the pros because, you know, you see teams draft these guys all the time. They're big, they're fast, they're, they've got amazing time to speed. And sometimes it works out. And I'm not saying I'm not saying anything against guys like that. But it's nice to have somebody who enters the league and just knows how to play already. Guy who's not so much a developmental player. And there were, you know, there were lots of guys who went in the first round this year who were kind of more on the developmental side who could have turned into excellent players. Garrett Wilson knows how to play the receiver position on day one. And it's going to be very exciting to watch him develop in the weeks ahead. And beyond him, you, know, you still have Elijah Moore, who you know, has been kind of quiet this year, but still has all that potential, still had that big stretch last season. You got Corey Davis, who's now in a role that suits him better, might be a more complimentary role than we, were, than we saw last year. This receiver position is now looking really solid. They, the one thing that it felt like they were lacking was that go-to guy, and maybe they found him. Now, speaking of positions, the Jets were looking to upgrade positions on the perimeter. We could talk about the position that lines up against the wide receiver on every play. That's corner. And Sauce Gardner, you know, he had a few hiccups against Amari Cooper, but Amari Cooper is a really good, speaking of good technicians, putting a guy in his second NFL game against Amari Cooper, you're going to have some moments where it looks rough. But I don't think Sauce Gardner got embarrassed. And Amari Cooper put up big numbers, but most of those were not against Sauce Gardner. And on the other side, DJ Reed just looks excellent. This past offseason, if you're looking at the guys the Jets brought in in free agency, it looks pretty ugly for the most part. But there's one exception. DJ Reed looks like just looks like a lockdown corner the first two weeks. Now, he and Gardner, they're going to get a much tougher matchup this week when they're going up against these Bengals receivers because we know the, we know what the Bengals bring to, this, to the table at the receiver position. But these guys have looked excellent. And not only that, they've helped in the run game. DJ Reed had four run stops in this game on Sunday. You know, as, as, much, as much issues as the Jets had in the run game, DJ Reed and Sauce Gardner, those guys can tackle, but they can also lock up receivers one-on-one. And a couple of weeks ago, I had Michael Manania on to preview the Baltimore game, my buddy who, uh, works, who writes at JetsXFactor.com, and we talked about how you know Baltimore, not really a team that has a dynamic group at the receiver position, so you, know, you would not really see the benefits of having shut down corners against them, because most of the time your corners are going to hold up okay against those wide receivers. This past week against Cleveland, you know, the Jets had some issues in the passing game, but it really wasn't Gardner Reed as much as it was the guys in the middle of the field. This week, we're going to, I think, could, we could begin to see the benefits of the Jets having really strong corner play. Gardner Reed on the outside, they're going to open up a lot for this defense because Robert Sala, through his first, you know, year in change with the Jets, has shown that he likes to get it, maybe not so much on early downs where he likes to play zone, but on third down. The, when the money, the, the play where the money downs, when the chips are down, that's where Robert Sala likes to get aggressive. And it becomes much easier to blitz. It becomes much easier to send extra extra guys at the quarterback if you could trust that your guys are going to hold up one-on-one. And it's one thing to have one guy who can hold up one-on-one. It's quite another if you can trust your top two corners to shut down the other t- team's top two receivers. That even if, his, even if the other team's quarterback's favorite target's taken away, He's not going to be able to turn to his number two receiver. Now, we again, bigger matchup coming up this weekend, but you have to love what you've seen with these guys. There are some problems for this Jets team on other aspects of this defense, but having quality corner play on the outside, having great corner play on the outside, that can make up quite a bit. And then I think you have to look at the running back position, another position where things are going well for the Jets. You look at the numbers, Michael Carter, Brees Hall, both efficient runners so far. A little interesting dynamic in Game 2. Now, Game 1, I don't think there was as much of a disparity, but Game 2, if you look at it, Carter was kind of the thunder. He was the guy the Jets had on the inside runs, and Hall was the outside runner. And the reason that's interesting is that Hall's the big back. Carter's kind of the undersized guy, but I said it through the offseason, and I saw plenty of analysis over the course of the offseason that the Jets needed to get you know, a speed back, or, or the, I'm sorry, the Jets, over the offseason, a lot of the analysis was that the Jets needed to get a, a big, tough inside runner to complement Carter. And listen, Brees Hall can be a tough inside runner. He could develop into that. But Carter 
if you look at his numbers last year and anything you could constitute as a power situation, he did pretty well. So I, I never really agreed with that. I felt like what the Jets really needed to compliment Carter with was a guy with that like fourth or fifth gear. Because I think that's the one thing Carter doesn't really have that breakaway speed, but he does everything else well. And I think you saw that the way the Jets you know, divided these carries. They used Hall as more of the outside guy, kind of a home run threat because of that speed. Now, I do think over the course of the year, and I've been pretty vocal on this, we'll see whether I'm right, I think over the course of the year, Brees Hall's ability is going to lead to him taking over the, as the number one back. It's not going to happen this week. It's not going to happen next week. But I think as we get deeper into the calendar, as we get to late October, as we get into November, I think Brees Hall is eventually going to figure it out and he's going to take over the lead back role. This is kind of how I was expecting it to go early in the season. I think the Jets are focused on the idea that a young guy's got to knock off the incumbent and Michael Carter's still going to have a big role. In when I say this, I'm not suggesting by any means that Michael Carter's going to be going to be relegated to the bench, but right now you kind of see it. Carter's kind of the one back. Brees is the number two back. I think they will reverse those roles as we move later, later into the season. I think, you know, this platoon right now with, you know, we saw week two with Carter inside call outside that may change, but Jets have been able to run the ball fairly effectively with these two backs so far. Again, both have pretty good yards per carry averages. So I think that this has been a success. So three areas where I think you could say the Jets offseason overhauls have worked. However, it's not true in every place. There have been a couple positions where what the Jets did this offseason, how they tried to improve certain positions, hasn't really been all that effective. And ahead here on the Locked on Jets podcast, we'll talk about them. The Jets play Cincinnati this weekend. It's a home game. Maybe you're traveling from out of town. Maybe you're an out-of-market Jets fan who's coming to NetLife Stadium for a game, and you're trying to figure out how you're going to get around. Well, let me tell you about Turo. It's the world's largest car-sharing marketplace. With Turo, you can book any car you want, wherever you want it, from a community of local hosts. You can browse a huge selection of vehicles for just about any occasion or budget across the U.S., Canada, and the U.K. You can book a spacious SUV or minivan for a family road trip. You can get a classic or luxury car for a special event, birthday, or holiday. You can find affordable economy cars if you're on a budget and just need to get from point A to point B. Test drive that electric vehicle you had your eye on to see how it fits in your everyday life. You have all these options. Or if you're going to Jets Bengals and you're coming in from out of town, many Turo hosts can deliver the car right to you. Every trip is backed by liability insurance, terms, conditions, and exclusions that apply. Ditch boring rental cars and find your drive at Turo.com. Thank you so much for making Locked On Jets your first listen or first watch every day. This show's free and it's available on all platforms, including YouTube. It's a daily podcast. We have new episodes each day, Monday through Friday. If you enjoy it, please subscribe. You'll receive notifications as new episodes are posted. Today we're talking about things that have worked, things that haven't worked for the Jets in the first two weeks. And I'm especially focusing on the, the positions where they really made off-season overhauls. Now, we're only two weeks in. I talked positively about some positions in the first segment. I'm going to talk negatively about some positions here. It's important to know we're only two weeks into a 17-game season. The positions where the Jets are doing well, you know, they're one or two weeks away from us having concerns. The positions where that have, where things have not gone so well, you know, they're a game or two away from really turning things around. But I think if we're talking about disappointing positions for the Jets so far, we'd have to talk about the tight end position where CJ Uzama's injured, really has not really did not play much week one. It was not in the lineup week two. Jeremy Rucker dropped a pass week two. I'm not going to get on Jeremy Rucker all that much because I feel like he's a developmental player. Guy who really should not be seeing the field much this year. The plan was never for Jeremy Rucker to see the field much this year. Tyler Conklin's the guy who's played a lot for the Jets. And I was debating whether or not I was going to say what I'm about to say. Because it's a very loaded topic. I Listen, if you're new to the show... I'm not one who really tries to go into a lot of hot takes. I try not to be, like, overly controversial. I try and give you, like, good analysis. You know, sometimes I'm successful, sometimes I fail. So I debated whether I was going to say this or not about Tyler Conklin. But I I think I have to be honest with you. As your host, I need to give you honesty. So this is how I feel right now. Tyler Conklin has worked a miracle. He has done what I thought was impossible. After watching Tyler Conklin play for two games, I miss Ryan Griffin. I miss Ryan Griffin because Tyler Conklin has been so unbelievably unbelievably bad. He has shown zero playmaking ability. He's dropped two passes. He's fumbled twice in ten receptions. I mean, 
I can't believe I'm saying this. I spent three years complaining about Ryan Griffin. Even when Ryan Griffin was putting up decent numbers in 2019, I was complaining about him. I was trying to figure out how to get him off the team. I miss Ryan Griffin now because of Tyler Conklin. This guy has shown zero, zero playmaking ability. I mean, at least Ryan Griffin could do one thing. And it was not very useful, but he could at least catch the ball and hold on to it on short passes. Tyler Conklin has done nothing. I mean, listen, I know two games in. I know he's got time to redeem himself. Listen, nobody's going to be happier if he catches a touchdown this weekend. And he lives up to the contract. I'm not saying this is impossible. What I'm saying through two games, this guy's been worse than Ryan Griffin. The Jet, the, through two games, Tyler Conklin has, been the, has done the impossible. He has downgraded the tight end position from Ryan Griffin. That's where we're at right now with Tyler Conklin. Tyler Conklin, please get better. I never thought there would be a day where I would be nostalgic for the days of Ryan Griffin. But Tyler Conklin has done this. That is how bad Tyler Conklin has looked this, for the first two weeks. Hopefully he gets better. Can't get much worse than this. Uh, I shouldn't say that because I felt that way with Ryan Griffin. Please, Tyler Conklin, get better. Let this podcast episode be something we laugh at five years from now. Oh, can you believe John went crazy after those two games? Can you believe how bad Tyler Conklin looked that we actually compared it? Please, this has been tough to watch. And speaking of t- tough to watch, I think the other position, you know, I'm, really, I'm not really going to focus on the offensive line because on paper they were only supposed to add one new player. It hasn't gone well for Lakin Tomlinson, and of course you have the issues with the injuries at tackle, but I don't think the offensive line was really overhauled this year, so I'm not really going to include them. Safety, though. It's not been good. We, we knew it was going to be a question mark entering the season. It has not worked out at all. In fact, I'm go- I would be willing to wager that... You're probably going too easy on the safety position. Why do I say that? Because frequently what happens is first impressions stick in our mind. And that first quarter of game one against Baltimore, Jordan Whitehead looked really good. He was flying out, he was flying to the football, he was making plays, he was making tackles, he was getting stops. And ever since that first quarter, Jordan Whitehead's been terrible. I mean, two long touchdowns last weekend in the second half. He played a role in both. And his safety partner played a role in both, LaMarcus Jordan. Neither of these guys has really ever... I mean, these guys, if you're watching this game, especially against Cleveland, these guys are flying out of control all over the field. It's kind of like watching Ashton Davis last year, to be honest with you. Ashton Davis, who had one snap and one interception uh, week two against Cleveland. It was the decisive interception. It was the the pick that ended the game. These guys just have been bad at the back of the defense. I mean, you look at the the issues the Jets are having. I mean, they're having too many breakdowns. And if you're a Jets fan, you've been a Jets fan for a while... You've seen this before. You've seen this story before. This was, you know, maybe you got a couple of years of a reprieve when you had Marcus May and Jamal Adams as your safety duo. But bad safety play and the Jets have gone hand in hand for quite a long time. You know, Adams May, that duo was a bit of an exception. You go back, you had Kerry Rhodes for a little stretch. I mean, that was an exception. Jim Leonard was solid. But, I mean, you go back like 20 years, the Jets just have not had good safety play since the turn of the century, with a few exceptions. And it looks like we're here again. And I think we all knew LaMarcus Joyner. That was going to be an issue. I'm not sure I was expecting him to be this bad. I was expecting, if nothing else, a guy who wasn't great, but a guy who at least would know where to be. But he's always out of position. And Jordan Whitehead, after one good quarter, is not looking very good. Bad in coverage, shaky against the run. It's not been good. Can the tight end position improve? Well, I mean, there's only one way to go from here. And Uzama really hasn't played much, so maybe Uzama gets on the field. Maybe Conklin looks less like Ryan Griffin. That can turn around. Safety is a big concern. I think safety is a big concern. Whitehead, again, had that one good quarter, but you know, it looked pretty shaky. And I, I got to be honest with you, when I was like getting ready for the season, I watched some of Whitehead's film in Tampa Bay last year. The more I watched, the more I was a little concerned about his level of play. Because you can't have miscommunication. You can't have guys taking bad angles at the safety position. It felt like Whitehead was doing that a lot. And Joyner... It was a roll of the dice. I did not hate bringing him back at the number the Jets brought him back at. I did not love, though, the fact he was kind of just handed the starting job. Because even going back to preseason, it was really shaky. It was really shaky for LaMarcus Joyner. So we've talked about things that have worked. We've talked about things that haven't worked. But there's one very big unknown right now. The quarterback position. As we close out this Tuesday episode of Locked On Jets, we'll discuss what's to come when Zach Wilson returns. 
Well, if you're a daily fantasy sports fan, I want to tell you about prize picks. Here's how it works. You pick two to five players, and if they score more or less than their prize picks projection, you can win up to 10 times your money on any entry. Now, I'm not sure what Tyler Conklin's projection is for next week, but I think, you know, I would probably bet very low on Tyler Conklin. But you can do whatever you want. And with prize picks, there's no competing against other people. It's just you versus the projections available. And prize picks offers projections on any sport you watch. So it goes beyond the NFL. It's baseball, you know, it's college football, you know, down the line, we'll have the NBA, we'll have the NHL, soccer, and my personal favorite, disc golf. Uh, I still haven't tried prize picks disc golf, but if you have, if you have, I would love to hear your experience. Just download the prize picks app or go to prizepicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code locked on. It's one word with no space, L O C K E D O N. That means if you deposit $50, prize picks gives you another 50. If you deposit a hundred prize picks gives you another hundred. Just don't forget to use promo code locked on at sign in for an instant deposit match of up to $100 using prize picks. This is the Locked On Jets podcast here on this Tuesday. We're talking about what happened for the Jets over the course of the offseason. We've talked about some of the moves they made that have worked, some that haven't. Now I'd like to close out the show by talking about something that's kind of status quo, and that's the quarterback position, because all of these moves were a means to an end. The means to the end was to support Zach Wilson. Now you might say, well, how is bringing in corners really going to help Zach Wilson? How's bringing in safety is really going to help Zach Wilson? Well, you don't want to put Zach Wilson into a situation where he's got to put up 40 points to win a game because then you're going to put him in spots where he's going to try and force the ball, where he's going to try and do too much. When you are developing a young quarterback, this is something the Jets have learned the hard way through the years. You need to lift him up. You can't ask for him to lift the team up. Now, there are going to be points where Zach Wilson, you want to see him do something special, but these have to be the exceptions. You want to see a few flashes here or there. You don't want it to be regular that Zach Wilson has to do something spectacular to keep your team in the game. And, you know, we've, as we've talked about, there are some things that have worked well that the Jets did in the offseason. Others that really haven't gone so well so far. But Zach Wilson's returning. Now, he's not returning this week. Already reports out Joe Flacco starting against the Bengals, which, you know, no surprise. Flacco's not going to the bench for Mike White. You know, it, as exciting as the Mike White revenge game against the Bengals would be, it wasn't happening after Flacco led the Jets to that comeback victory. I mean, if the Jets did not bench Flacco after week one, after that performance, they're certainly not going to bench him off four, four touchdowns and a comeback victory. And the Jets had already ruled Zach Wilson out. Before week one, Robert Sala said he's out at least three weeks, so there was no chance of Zach Wilson playing against the Bengals. His return could come as soon as week four against the Steelers, though. And listen... There's, I just don't see any way Flacco stays in the lineup. I know there's going to be some people who say if the Jets win, Flacco should stay there. In another context, I might agree, but I think we've seen that you know even with the great numbers Flacco's put up, that there are things he takes off the table. The offense is limited to a large extent when Flacco's in there. And yeah, I know 31 points against Cleveland, but they're not going to put up a ton of points with Flacco at the quarterback position. So it's going to be Zach who goes in. Zach's the young quarterback. He's the young franchise quarterback. What do we need to see out of Zach this season? Well, first of all, you'd like to see him show he's got a greater command of the system. He's more confident making his reads. I think back to the Tampa Bay game, Week 17 last year. It was the first time all year, and the only time last year, where I really felt like he was comfortable playing from the pocket. Where it felt like he was in command, he understood the route combinations, how they meshed with the other team's defense. And it was really impressive, in part because... He did not have a ton of receivers in that game. He did not have many quality receivers because the Jets had a bunch of injuries at the receiver position. So that's that's number one. It's kind of a mix because I could say, I would almost say play efficiently because you say you want him to avoid turnovers. I felt like last year, late in the season, he was maybe a little too protective of the football at times. And he was not that efficient. He was not making many plays. So I want him to protect the football, but I also want him to find the right balance of when to be aggressive, when to try and make plays down the field. And, of course, he's got to be more accurate on short passes. Short passes were an issue last year. I don't know what the Jets have tried with his mechanics, but you know something needed to be re- reworked in the offseason. Hopefully Zach's more effective completing short passes. You know, I see people say, well, the Jets need to build their offense around the long ball, around the deep ball. Look, in today's NFL, you got to complete short passes. That's just a non-negotiable. And if Zach Wilson can do this, this Jets season could be really fun. 
because I've told you, like, the skill players are looking really solid right now. Unlike with Sam, the Jets actually have built a pretty solid offense around Zach Wilson. They've built guys, they've built an offense with guys who can kind of take on some of the load, who can help lift Zach Wilson up. And perhaps they do have that go-to guy that Sam never had in Garrett Wilson, and along with a really solid supporting cast. And again, I'm not ruling out Brees Hall. I'm not ruling out uh, Elijah Moore. And Michael Carter's in the mix as well. So suddenly there's a a really solid group of skill players around Zach Wilson that can help him navigate his second year in the NFL. And we've seen this offense, you know, last week kind of work with Flacco. And say what you will, and listen, you know, Flacco was pretty good against the Browns, I I will say, but Zach Wilson's got more potential than Joe Flacco. So if Zach Wilson can actually perform at a high level, suddenly this you know this season could get pretty interesting for the Jets really quickly. But a lot of it does come back to come down to Zach. We've talked about what's worked, we've talked about what hasn't worked, and now we've talked about the most important thing, the thing we haven't seen yet, Zach Wilson. So that's all for today's episode. This has been the Locked On Jets Podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day is our motto. Big shout out to subscribers to this podcast. Thank you so much for supporting the show. And to join that group, just hit the subscribe button wherever you're watching or listening. Click the bell if you're watching on YouTube to get notifications. You'll never miss an episode. If you're listening on a podcast source, please give the show a five-star review. If you're watching on YouTube, please a big thumbs up. Both of these help the channel out and help the other Jets fans find the podcast. Hope you have a wonderful Tuesday, everybody, and send in your mailbag questions. We're having our weekly mailbag on Wednesday.